Good morning, everybody. How are you? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning. It's great to stay up late. Good morning, good morning for you. Right. Okay, well done. Just stay there. So if you're listening on podcast, Mark is now in the hall, lying on his stomach, holding his feet, lifting up his head from the floor. So if you've got a picture, do you remember we all used to do this when we were kids? Right. Who can tell me why Mark is doing that? Why is Mark doing that? Making me feel horny. Why is Mark doing that? Who who has listened to yesterday's podcast and knows what that is? Hang on, Mark. Shush a minute. You can come down if you want. What that is, what's it called, and why is he doing it? For those listening on podcast, Mark has now collapsed on a very, very dusty floor. He'll probably have an asthma attack in a minute. But I'm ready for action. It's worked. <laughs> You said, why do you always have to tell everyone the answer? It's worse. I was going to give someone a cord. Mm. You've now said the answer. Mm. He's a nightmare. <sighs> Hello, everyone. So who knows what that position oh, is called? Know. Anyone who can guess what that position is called and why he did it will get a cord. A signed cord. So... Morning, morning everyone. Sorry, morning, uh, morning, 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 morning. He's just getting his breath back and take his temperature. <laughs> Nobody knows the name of that pose. Hi, evening from Windy Brisbane. Hi, Natalie. Hi, Creator Holic. Hi, Jackie Rosewell. Okay, this is probably a bit slow, I think, on the catch up. So, when I see an answer come up that is right, I will call your name, and you must go to the email. Um, uh, Michelle's email and say that you won a card. I'm dead. That you won a card from um, being able to name Mark's strange position and why he was doing it. God, you're taking it very seriously. It's serious. It's a card. There's a signed card here. Bloody hell. Taking it very seriously. Morning, everyone. Well, look, put it... Oh, no, I've given it away, though, haven't I? Yeah, just don't say anything else. All right. Well, can I say anything? Yeah, let's carry on. Yeah. Uh, my temperature was 95.4 Fahrenheit. That's good. I was panicked because I thought that was Celsius, and I thought, <laughs> fuck, I've exploded. I'm, I'm on fire. Morning, so, everyone. good morning. Oh, we're doing the Jerry, Jerry story. Yeah. About new hubby rules. New hubby rules, absolutely. New rules um, off the back of the allegations of him having an affair. So this will be... Well, all sexting. A load of sexting. Sexting. This will be just all a load of conjecture, won't well, it? Well, it's, it's an astonishing piece. It's an astonishing piece when we get to it. The, the, the certainty they have in the quotes. Really? How do they know this? Are they in the marriage? Well, I didn't actually realise we were doing it, so I didn't read the whole article. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, right. You sent it. I, thought, uh, I know, I but I thought we'd rejected it. We're going to talk about gentlemen's clubs. I've asked the question already as a poll. What do you think of gentlemen's clubs? Do you agree with there being gentlemen's clubs? This is off the back of the story of the Garrick Club and some senior members of MI6 and the civil service uh, feeling they had to resign due to its lack of inclusivity yesterday. Um, we're going to be talking about Gen Zers not driving. Are they scaredy cats? Are they environmentalists? Or is it just too bloody expensive? Um, and we are the loneliest nation in middle age. Or, no, middle aged people are the loneliest people. I don't know if it's about us, because the, the, the survey country. was done in Arizona, wasn't it? Oh. Which is an odd one. Hang on a minute. Where's England? Oh, no, it is England's middle age. I was going to say. And it's England's, not Scotland. Are the most worse. lonely in Europe. Would you agree? So there we go. And why is it still such a taboo subject to say, I am lonely? So looking at that, do you agree with there being gentlemen's clubs? At the moment, 46% of you say no. So shall I, shall we kick off with this? Yeah, so this was something you were listening to yesterday on the radio, weren't you? This was being talked about in a big way. I was quite surprised. So there's a club called the Garrick Club. It's been around for hundreds of years. It was set up in the name of the, the, the I think he was a playwright and theatre impresario. Uh, is it John Garrick? Garrick? Um, you know, there's the Garrick Theatre. Um, and this was the story yesterday that they have published a list of all the members. Now, I was, this struck me, there was a couple of curious things about this. One, there's only 1,500 members, which is quite small. Two, uh, yeah, well, not only, it's a lot of money, but I'm surprised for the calibre of person it, uh, that goes there as a member, including the key. 
It's a thousand pounds a year to have free use of their dining areas, their bars and all this kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> Faye just said, I received free membership just there. I thought you meant to the Garrett Club. I was going to say, Faye, you won't be let in. <laughs> but anyway, top civil servant Simon Case has followed Richard Moore, who I believe is the head of MI6, um, and they've left because of upset and criticism within their own sort of working, you know, within their own sort of organisations regarding the fact that they should be part of such a closed off, essentially sexist and discriminatory and non-inclusive club. And so the question here is, and what people were phoning up, and sort of lots of women were phoning up yesterday, saying, well, they let us in through the side door. And there were lots of people from the Cotswolds going, well, when I go with my husband, they let us in through the side door with a sort of blanket over your head, but you mustn't admit you're a woman. No, they don't, they don't do that. But, um, you know, lots of politicians, lots of artists, Stephen Fry is a member. Um, you've got sort of uh, Michael Gove, you've got, not surprisingly, uh, the little kind of Lord Fauntleroy chap, he, he's a member. Um, and then you've got uh, people like, what's the name of the actor? Matthew McFadden, I was surprised by him. Uh, and there was a really interesting thing, apparently, a couple of years ago. So why were you surprised by him? By what? By him being a member. Who? Because I think I have a really, really fixed idea that these places are the hotbeds of misogyny mm. and evil intent. But what if they're not? Ha I think maybe in the past that they were. I mean, you're going to be surprised what I think. Well, I'm kind I of think, now not because you've I, done a spoiler. I oh. think that I would love a women's only club. Right. <clears throat> so I do think... I think probably in the past, and there probably are still some real old codgers Hayley, in there. just making a note. That I wouldn't want to spend any time with. Um, right, that's a I, good point. But I do think that... What do you... Th I, I love just women's company. I really, really love it. Like, however old you are, and we know this from our kids, our young kids who are young and gorgeous, you know, that it's just constant harassment. Like, if they're drinking and they're in a pub or if they're, you know, our eldest. Mm. But, um, and then when you're older, it might be just like, just like drunken behaviour from men and stuff. And you just don't want to do it. And it's a different vibe in this men round. Nothing would make me happier than a women's only club. I would immediately feel safe and cosy and I, I think I would feel more able to just talk to people that I didn't know. I would love it. I would relish it. Well, well, hang on a minute. You're, yes. on, you're on a show that only has women on it. Yeah, and that's I love kind it. of like a woman's club. I love it, but we do have men that work with us. No, and no, actually, no, I course. love, I love, I love the, the the guys that work on the show. Actually, okay. Um, me... I, I don't like an all female, just female workplace. Yeah. I wouldn't like that because I like the different energies when you're working. Yeah. But if I'm relaxing. I really love to be just around women. I have no need for male attention or the male gaze or the male approval. I, I just I just don't... I'm not interested. But interestingly, a couple of women's clubs that have been set up over the last couple of years apparently have had to close because there was really? simply zero appetite. But where were they? Oh, my God. zero time. My problem isn't necessarily with the idea of women-only spaces or men-only spaces. My problem with this is... The higher echelons <coughs> all having an incredibly cosseted. So you've got judges in there. You've got politicians. Mm. Sorry, you've sorry. Got, we've got politicians in there. We've got judges in there. We've got people who are hugely influential in the country. Who going back to this idea that most of them feel so disconnected from the real world in the first place. I personally think, for my issue with this, is less even about the gender. Because, like you say, who'd want to go? But more about the class control. Yeah, I think that's more what it's about. And the thing is, the Garrick is a very particular place. Yeah, it's it? more but, of a loving. But if club. we were to, they were to pop up all over the place, men's men's clubs and women's clubs. I, I would love that idea. But, there are but loads I get what of you're, you're talking about. You're talking about everything that we can't stand. That establishment thing. You know, we're better than you. And I mean, like, well, yeah, I mean, excluding good... everyone apart from themselves. Exactly. I mean, for example. I would have more of a problem with the exclusion of women, say, at a working men's club in a bar. I don't know, you know. I wouldn't. Well, I don't know, because then it's less of a... But... Why do we have to see it as exclusion? Why can't we see it as a coming together of, 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 of people? Yeah. And that maybe men as well like Good to point, just... Good point, Jackie Villino. Not... Women's Institute's been going for years. Yeah, to not have the pressure... Of a, but typical women's institute, what do they do? Get together, work very hard, raise money for charity. 
my idea of the gentleman's club is just sitting, smoking, eating, being cared for. So, Hugo, how's it been you put, going on you the put, shoot? You put a group of women together and then without, before long, they're arranging something to help another group of people out or to start a campaign or something. Or to quote someone on Married at First Sight, I hope you've put a muzzle on your wife. What about that? Mm, if you watch Married at First Sight, you know what we mean. It was Australian, though. Yes, I know, but I was playing I know, a Gary no. club, so I was kind of conflating the two. Siobhan Jordan, you've summed it up beautifully. Elitist, archaic, dangerously influential. That's my problem. Mm. It speaks to me of all those kind of odd sort of, what is it where you roll the trouser leg up, masons, and you shake in a funny but what way. what if we are stuck in another time warp thinking about it in this way? Like you said, Matthew McConaughey. 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 Is there, you know, what if there is a new breed of man going in there and that it's going to become, ah. you know, the future? You can't just have the future. You've got to, you've got to shake off the past well, at the in, same time. Interesting you should say that because Hugh Bonville, a couple of years ago, tried to um, uh, prove a point. He's a member of the Garrett Club. And he tried to get uh, Joanna Lumley to be the first honorary female member. Uh, it was voted, uh, and I think it was voted for by 51% of the men, but they had to have two thirds majority. But isn't it funny? When you think of for Joanna Lumley, what do you think of Joanna Lumley? You think of Joanna Lumley doing everything just perfectly, being an absolute lady. So she was probably considered a lady. She's, a very yes, lady. Yes, she's a geezer bird. <clears throat> Last week, geezer when bird. I was at the Houses of Parliament and I was in all the areas that you can't go and like, oh my God, it was so beautiful down there, guys. Mark's been in there. You've, yeah, yeah. Years ago, haven't you? Yeah, quite dodgy. But really. like, oh my God, all the wooden panels and the libraries and the offices and all the people. It's a really exciting place to be. And Penny Mordaunt's office. It was like something out of the thick of it. It really, really was. But, and they had beautiful glass doors, you know, stencils. And I went, oh, look at that. Because it had ladies only and gentlemen. Ladies. Gentlemen Do you only. like being called a lady? No, I hate it. Why? And in fact, on Loose Women, when he says, please... Please, when well, Lee says, please uh, welcome the ladies, he goes, oh, yes, oh, now just on, here's the women, because I hate it. Girls? I Do you like being called girls? Girls, that's my favourite. Bitches? Golden girls would be my favourite. Bitches? Be Slappers? No. <laughs> okay, just, just sort of... Well, amongst friends, I don't mean my, my being called slapper, I don't really want to introduce as one on stage. No, welcome, <laughs> welcome on stage, the slappers! Uh, <laughs> so he says, if someone calls me a lady, I'll walk out of the room. <laughs> it's very, it makes me think of the Cotswolds. Uh, Carol Naismith, yeah. you've just said people of the Cotswolds. Uh, it used to be Islington Dormy, wankers. But Dormy now it's... really wants to know what Penny's like. Penny? Penny Mordaunt. <sighs> she... Are you allowed to say? I had a bad girl crush on her. And when I came out and we, we, I said to, I said to she Tits, felt, she felt fizzy. Titty Gritty, please follow Titty Gritty, my friend. I'm so proud of her today and you'll find out why if you follow her. Um, and Kaz and Hannah, I went, I think I've got a crush on Penny Morden, and they went, so have I, Kaz, and it's, she's very beautiful, like, very beautiful. Did she have a mace? very commanding. Did she have a mace? No, she didn't have a sword. sword. She was very commanding. She was very serious, but you could tell that she had, like, a sense of humour. She was, I said to Mark, I've never in my life witnessed such a good listener. Wow. She listened with such intent and then went shh, right to the end of it. And do you know what? She really admitted some stuff where they go wrong and all of this. I just, I loved her. Well, we wanted her. Well, I don't, well, I don't know if you remember. Hostings. I mean, we're not conservative voters or supporters, but I don't even remember when there was the leadership election or di uh, contest. The only one I felt vaguely drawn to was Penny Morden. So did you have a fanny flutter? A little bit. Wow. Well... It was Casmore that said that. She said she had a bit of a fizz. It wasn't that. I was just like in awe. Right. And and I couldn't talk. You know, you know when we talk. About Mark, so, now no, stop. No, 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 no. Nothing. Say nothing. No, no, no. No, say zero. I just want to say. Zero. No, no, right, no. Right, moving on. And I'm just, say the just next one. What are we moving on to? No, just, no, I don't. Write it down. What is it you're wanting to say? Uh, when we next do. No. I knew that's what you were going to say. The answer is no. If you say it, I'm not going to talk to you for the rest of the day. Right. Carry on. Okay, well, it kind of brings us neatly what I've just written on the piece of paper to Jerry, Jerry Halliwell or Jerry Horner, uh, which uh, the surname becomes a little bit um, <laughs> t 
testy given the story. Now, this is Jerry Horner's story. I've really felt for her in all of this as her husband, partner, Christian Horner, who's part of the Red Bull Formula One team, well, it's very high up. Um, he's been caught up in a sexting scandal. Um, and albeit that they did a deep investigation, a deep dive, uh, they went through kind of some kind of due diligence and process. He was kind of cleared or found to have not broken any sort of rules, what have you. A day or two later, I don't know if you know, the story broke that a whole, all of the private texts that were sent were, were actually sent to journalists and to lots of people within Formula One. So there's obviously, you know, someone very aggrieved with the fact that they didn't feel the outcome of the inquiry was quite right. In all of this, there's the sadness, as there is for anyone, of, of, of I thought, Jerry Halliwell. And, and you, you couldn't help but feel that, that, you know, there was almost in the press a kind of prurient kind of, well, you know, she, her sort of idyll. Has, do you remember there was, we did Coffee Moaning one when it's like, why well, do you know it was an idyll in the first place? All this nonsense. Maybe they've been working through their own shit anyway. But this is a piece that you found in Closer magazine, which I realise I've kind of hijacked you with. I didn't mean to, because you were... Didn't no, I didn't know we were it. doing it, so carry on, because I, no, I didn't read it. In, um, in, in, and so this is, this, this is the idea that she's putting in place some rules. And I wanted to... I, I was curious to know whether what you thought means, you know, can a set of rules after an infidelity, mm. not that he's been unfaithful, I'm not saying that, but after sort of something like this, perhaps he sent inappropriate texts, can a set of rules okay, rescue Okay, so are inappropriate texts infidelity? I think sexting is. I do. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, he has denied all of this, hasn't he? He's Dawny, can it. you get rid of that aubergine I sent you the other day? <laughs> he, he, has, he has denied it. Denied all the allegations. But so let's take it away from them. Okay, because let's go through this her is strict loads of stuff. marriage rules. Yes, yeah, this, is, this is a load of stuff in the newspapers and magazines that none of us know whether no. it's the truth or not. And these are people's lives and it's yeah. horrible. But <coughs> I was interested in strict rules. Can that ever make you feel well, safe? Well, I've been in this situation, so I'm going to throw myself under the bus now. Right. Um, so rather than us sort of... Picking this around is, Jerry this Horner's. This is what I thought would be interesting yeah. if we did this because I, think I thought rather than picking around Jerry Horner's, you know, the sadness or the you know, private kind of I strife that they're going through. Mm. Um, I'm just going to lift some of the rules. Allegedly, someone somewhere thinks they know that are being used, and they include no contact whatsoever with any female colleagues via phone, no uh, sharing her sharing his passwords with her. Sticking to a curfew, which will have him home every evening where possible, as well as opening up for honest and frank conversations. Now, I think this is, when I read that list, I felt really sad. Again, as you rightly said, we don't know if this is true or not. I felt really sad for her and I felt really sad for him because I... But give us your experience. I'm about to. And the reason I felt sad for her and I felt sad for him is, you know, if something's gone wrong in a relationship, when something went wrong in mine and I was unfaithful and I had a fling and what have you, and we did, you know, a set of rules, not written, but a set of guarantees was sought from me that I wouldn't do this and I was wouldn't that something drink this that you amount decided and I wouldn't go together? out. No. So, because that's what I was wondering as well. If it's like... See, I can imagine you doing something like where you really want to prove it and you want to say you know, let's let me give you this list of guarantees mm. and maybe that's a little more possible that might be success, though I don't think really. But I think if somebody's imposing rules and regulations, it speaks to how frightened they are mm. and it speaks to that they don't want to break up, but probably in their soul they know that they're never going to trust you again. Well, I think baked into that set of rules coming from the partner who's been wronged or hurt or what have you is unfortunately the death spiral of the relationship yeah. because I think there is an acknowledgement in trying to set what often become quite unrealistic. So what were of, some of the rules? For me? Mm. Uh, it, well, when I read the list, they were quite similar. I mean, we, back, back in the day, mobile phones weren't quite the thing. It wasn't texting. Just it wonder quite if so you've much. done this, put but rules it, in after being hurt or being... But yeah. a, a ban was put on me talking to a particular person in the office. A ban was put on me or, she, you know... What, it, in an office where that, that person was going to be? Well, di directly opposite me. Oh, God. I mean, yeah, that was quite hard. Um, uh, um, a, a knowledge being, not, not a ban, but knowing exactly how, who I was out with on a certain night, uh, an ability to cross-reference that, um, uh, talking about uh, a curfew, you know, checking in on times, those times oh, being stuck Vicky to. Vicky Waiting said she did last week. 
what? Put in a set of rules. Oh, right. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, wow. And, and, and so, with all the will in the world, of course, I came out of that wanting to try and kind of, you know, observe them and rescue them. I was in my early, hang on, I was in my early 20s. And this is the sort of benefit of hindsight. I was young, I didn't, you know, we, we'd made all sorts of mistakes. We'd made, we'd, you, we had a house, we had a baby. It was all kinds of, you know, stuff was happening that I was ill-equipped to manage or deal and with. And how old were you 24, 25. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when I look back, I sort of think, I, I wanted to make it work because I thought it was the right thing to do. Mm. But I see in this, unrealistic goals for the oh, relationship. Oh, look at this. Ali Cap, I have loads of rules for my husband. He constantly lies to me. Oh, sweetheart. See, that is the thing, isn't it? It's like you've got loads of rules, but he constantly lies to you. Mm. So for you, it doesn't work, does mm. it, for you? But I wonder if it's ever worked for anyone. I mean, when I Ooh, think hang on, hang of on. Various... Vicky waiting. The trust has been smashed to pieces, but I love him and our life. Mm. Oh, sweetheart. Look, well, I've said this many times on this room, and there's always a sharp intake of breath. And in fact, I might have said this last week when we talked about Jerry, Jerry Horner. Um, and I was saying, you know, with Mark, I said, you know, we've worked so hard at our marriage. We've got 20 years with us. We've built this life together. We've got these children. It's... Mylene did such a good breakdown of actually what happens when you break up and the ripples and... The, she's such a smart woman. I love Mylene Class. I want to put that out right there. Mm. I love Mylene Class. Mm. Really, really like her. Um, and, you know, she... We all kind of know about, like, what it... But she just did it with such detail. You know, this wasn't on the show. This was backstage. And you know, think, you know, I just wouldn't just throw us away. Mm. Now, that would, would probably be an indiscretion. But if I found out you'd been having an affair, mm. like for months, say, I... How am I ever going to believe... Because you wouldn't be the person that I think you are. Because a lot of why I love you is because I think you're incredibly loyal. And, also, and you've worked really hard to be this very decent and moral person. So, But also I do understand that people are fallible. And in a way that I didn't... Because apparently they were telling us at Loose Women... They've got a clip of us like 20 years ago where we would go, no way, like that, I'm out the door, that'd be it, finished if somebody... And I was like, really? Wow. And they said, yeah, you were the complete opposite of the it way that you were. It does show you how you changed. Up, we yeah. But, I just want to read out some comments because mm. this is really speaking to a lot of people. Um, why do people cheat, says Ross Hatch? What's going wrong at home for them? Uh, Victoria well, Moore, yes, it's easy to always, say leave them. always, though, Ross. Some people are just serial cheaters. Yeah. You know, and, and sometimes... A relationship's communication is broke down, broken yep. down, and sometimes people are just nasty fuckers. Cambo, when trust is broken, it's incredibly difficult to find it again. Whether people want to admit it or not, in most cases, it lingers around even after year, years later. Mm. Now, that's an interesting point that you mentioned there, Cambo, because for me, what ended up buckling it fundamentally in the relationship in the end was I, you know, my partner couldn't overcome the broken heart, and I, I'd broken their heart, and so. I knew, there was a point at which I knew, not only could I not subscribe to these rules anymore because I was, for whatever reasons, because of the break, breakdown of trust, because I'd hurt her so much, there was the intimacy or the affection or the closeness between us had vaporized, the rules were in place. And I knew that I'd got to a point where I couldn't mend her heart. I literally couldn't no. do it. You could see that she was never gonna forgive. Yeah, and I don't... And, and you have to, I'm, I'm unless not, yeah. you think you're going to get to a place mm. of forgiveness mm. and not just, well, accepting, if you can truly forgive, I think you've got a chance. But I think that needs so much work. And I think, you know, mostly it needs help from some other person. Like mm. some Yeah, I think going into some kind, of some kind of therapy. Uh, but, but if you go into therapy off the back of this, so anyone here who's set those rules, like you said, Vicky you know, and you've tried some kind of, you know, uh, what's the, relate, marriage counselling. One of the, you, you make sure you go into it in a shared way. I mean, I know sometimes there can be a reluctance from one partner, but you've got to accept that there will, what you will find out in there, that there are two sides to the equation. I just want to read Zoe's, oh, Vicky, sexting does plan. ruin relationships. So Zoe found naked pictures on my ex's phone and it was someone I knew. I stayed with him for a while, but it was toxic yeah. after that. You just couldn't, could you? You just couldn't. Mm. I mean, if I'm sitting there thinking that if I found naked photos of someone I know, yeah. well, 
What would be Mind blown you, I can't up? help it because Kaz just keeps saying I it. know she does. <laughs> what would be... It, you would just be blown up as a person. I just would go, who, mm. who are... I would just... You'd be a stranger to me immediately. Mm. I would just go... I would be so shocked. Donnie Harvey, I looked at a girlfriend's <laughs> phone as I was looking... I can't looking, even imagine it. I looked at a girlfriend's phone uh, as I was looking for a bracelet she wanted and she had a picture of it on there. I was going to surprise her when I saw a text from my friend uh, regretting them having sex. Oh, Dawny. no. Dawny. Oh, sweetheart, how painful. Wow. Oh, my God, I can feel the pain. Oh, yeah, sorry. <sighs> That's... Mm. It's that kind of thing, isn't it? Your scalp stretches back over your head. It moves... Over. The, all those, mm. like... Mm. You sort of feel... All those bizarre things that happen to your body that tell you this is monumental and nobody can tell you it's not. Because it is. Devin, it's just yeah. the worst. And which takes me back to, as human beings... All that we are, really, is the way that we feel about others. It's the most important thing. Look at the way it can affect us. Mm. Devon yeah. B, it's the idea of what we have built together and known of each other. If he cheated, he would ruin what we've built and what I know. I don't know that I could ever trust him again. Yeah, mm. and to not be able to forgive doesn't... It's like I don't sort of... Mm. I don't look back and think, well, if you'd only forgiven, we could have... You know, I don't think like that at all. I think, sadly... You wouldn't you have been able to forgive if it had been the other way around. No, One absolutely One hundred percent. And really, it's the process, and because we had a young child, it's how do you disentangle in a way that doesn't leave such carnage when, behind. When you were that age, and life was very different for you, you know, it had a very chaotic upbringing, you hadn't had really good examples of relationships, you know, so I have huge sympathy and understanding for you on that. I, I was mm. very lucky. I came from a relationship where I just... You know, it was a very sort of moral household without mm. it being a moral household. It was yeah, just, yeah. you know, it was just, yeah. But um, so I was lucky. So it's just in me because it's all that I'd ever seen. One was hadn't, hippie madness. You hadn't grown up with that, you know, and it was chaos. And well, no, were, no. And, and you were drinking on your mental health problems and all of that. But were you even then able to say to yourself, my God, if this had been the other way around, there is no way I would be able to do yes, it. But I would be wanting to put a million rules and regulations in. Would you I, have, well, yes, say? yes. And I think that's yeah. probably one of the reasons I knew this would, would not be resolved. It, it just wouldn't re resolve. Interestingly, the other point around it, which I think created a lot of internal pressure for myself, was was actually, Mum, I know you won't mind me talking about this, but the kind of, it, the standing joke in the family was that I became quite straight and normal and had a long-term relationship when I was young because it was quite chaotic and sort of, you know, lots of different relationships going on and people coming and going. And weirdly, I think what I was signing up to and having a baby and doing all these things at quite a young age was somehow correct coursing myself towards something I didn't really know what the fucking actual nuts and bolts of that were you know so I was, I was, I was trying to live a grown-up life way beyond me you could say I'm, I still am I know somebody <laughs> who found out their partner was having an affair because the messages came through on the child's iPad oh dear shared really thingamajig oh my god Reese Roberts can you ever truly forgive an indiscretion I wonder because it can always be Excuse me, it can always be used as extra arsenal in an argument or disagreement in a relationship. Absolutely well, but, right. But I think that's when you haven't forgiven. Mm. And I think when people just try and bury it and say, well, right, okay, well, we're not going to talk about it. Or a person has a certain amount of time that they've got to be angry, they've got to be hurt, they've got to be upset, and they've got to say that to that other person. Mm. And the other person, I think, often might say, well, can we just leave it now? That's danger zone. Mm. It's got to get to a point where you've listened to everything, you've validated that person's feelings. I think mm. that's the thing to just, that person needs to hear back what the, the person really understands what they've done. Okay, I mean, w wonderful and comments, guys. Really Thank hard. you for sharing. And sorry if it's triggered or, oh. or, or you know, kicked up the, the sort of dust on sort of some, some tricky moments. Um, I think, what's, I think the, the thing here is, is not to judge. I think story, rules and regulations could be put in place. When my now husband and I first dated, he cheated. We broke up. Then years later, we met each other and we had both changed and have now been married for 18 years. That's lovely, Christine. That is lovely. Jackie Valina's um, giving you a compliment. Oh, thank Jackie. Huge respect for you. Uh, Huge respect managed... for you. Oh, are. bless you. Thank you so much, Jackie. He has. So, well, and also, the, really the other thing about recovery is, you know, you, you try to make amends, but you don't make amends directly to people for whom it would could kick up sort of old memories. So it's not a case of me literally going back and sort of saying so. Some people mistake that because they just want to make themselves feel better. 
I'm going to go and apologise to everyone I wronged and did things to, because actually that's part of the programme of recovery. There's well, that actually bit... can be an emotional dump onto a person. Well, it absolutely you... can, and it can kick stuff up for other people that actually they don't deserve or don't want, and they've managed. and they've put... So it's about acknowledging that those people you should and can say sorry to. So it's that the novel, I've, that novel I've just read that I recommended on um, yeah. the... Uh, Members area, that they, that comes up in Does that. Does it? Yeah. Okay, what should we go for now? Gen Z not driving or loneliest country in I think in we should age. leave loneliest tomorrow because I think we should do it because okay. I think we'll get a lot of answers like this. Yeah, I think so. We're going to, gonna, yeah, this is the, we'll do the report into England being, middle, England's middle age being the loneliest there is tomorrow. But Gen Z and driving, um, this is... Uh, Non-driving young adults cost parents 1300 a year, but a licence is a waste, says uh, uh, an opinion piece, a first-person opinion piece in The Times. Um, and this is the story that more and more youngsters um, are not learning to drive. It's going to cost something like £7,500 a year to drive. That's, that's Well, first of all, the cost of the lessons. So the lessons, yeah, first. But then and then you car. need so many because they've upped or they've, they've made the test so much more difficult, haven't they? Mm. Um, so first of all, you, you've got to really save up or have nice mummy and daddy who are going to pay for you, um, first of all. So I think that puts a lot of people off, doesn't it? And then mm. time rolls by. And also, if you fail your test, say, once, twice, three times, which I know a number of people have, and you're young and you've saved up that money or your parents have even, you know, given you that money. You know, it, it you know, you're you're slightly disincentivized to have another crack at it. I liked what she said. Me and Andy disagree on this somewhat. I but then maybe we agree more than more than I think. What this woman says is she says as a 17 year old, she was enticed by the possibility of it. She did it. She failed twice. And she says that really now the reason she doesn't turn back to the thought of driving is because she lives in a city. And albeit that we're all complaining about infrastructure and transport and what have you, it is pretty easy to get around, certainly London, by but Well, youngsters don't have... You can't well, get on a bus because you'll be swamped. Compared but, I mean, to being out in the, out in the sticks. sticks, of course, we have amazing... We have a multiple, multitude of different ways we can travel. But the travel is hideously expensive. You cannot rely on it. I'll tell you about getting back from Cornwall last week. Cambo says point. it's 50 quid an hour. Yeah. For his friend's door, 50 yeah. quid. It's like a packet of cigarettes. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and, um, but then, of course, cars are completely impossible to pay for. Mm. Thousands of pounds insurance. Well, and also the insurance is so high, especially when you start out driving as well. I mean, like we often say, you know, I, I often have to take cabs for work, for meetings, for all of that. And, you know, we'll look at the bills of them every year and I say... It's nothing like if I had a car. If yeah. we had two cars, it, it, it would be astronomical, well, well, two yeah. cars. Well, yeah, the, the, there's the cost of running a car. There's the cost, cost of buying a car. Then then there's the lunacy. I'm sure most of you who've got a car here knows. You know, uh, Dina goes through this. You get, you get a cheaper car because they're affordable and then you end up spending three times yeah. the price of the car keeping it just sort of road, road back. Yeah. My thinking about this is I didn't pass my test until I was 24. 20, no, 23, 23, because I lost a runner's, the possibility of a runner's job on a feature film because I couldn't drive. And I, I was like, oh That's God. why I want our girls to have a driving license, but to completely support them in not wanting a car and not wanting to drive. Right, okay. Especially in South I London. I didn't realise there was that same call. Because I, I, my yeah, line... because what if they missed out on something because they can't drive? My relief, though, is given the carnage and chaos of university, if I'd been able to drive, I know for a fact I'd have jumped behind a wheel. I, I don't... I, I think, you know, there's just... It, there's just so many dangers... For a young person to drive, it's just it's just scary as fuck. Fact that you can pass your test and then drive, they could she could drive to Leeds the next day if she wanted on the motorway. It's just, like, but I have felt my whole life like a total fucking idiot because I can't drive. And but I you, hate it. yeah, but you are slightly cursed by the fact that you can't really do bus. You know, there's a whole transport. I can do buses. Well, you can, but you can't. I mean, I have to confess, you can't really. I mean, I'm not. This is not. Well, buses, she's not Angelina Jolie. I recognise that, that. But no, but the hassle. The, the the jostling and the kind of close proximity, it it would be impossible for. I promise you. It would be yeah, well, no, no, it's it's not impossible. I could do it. Yeah, I no, could you do could it. Do but it. in this area, it's like quite it, on the buses. It can be quite rough and quite. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. And and I do stick out a bit like a Belizean beacon, but um, but I do. I use the tubes and stuff in yeah. town, and I use trains. I love trains, but it's just the buses I find very very like scary. But I, but as I say, if I take Ubers. Or I take a black cab 
for work. Because really, that's the only time I really need them, isn't it? It's if I'm in town meet with meetings and stuff. And it works out cheaper than if I owned a car. Well, the other problem I think for youngsters as well is when they compete, when everything is competing to suck their money, when a tequila shot is, is, is 10 quid in a bar, um, then, you know, the thought of all those other costs on a car, and also the other, the other factor to put a fact in, factor in is, of course, when you're driving, you then can't indulge in whatever fun you're going to be doing wherever you're doing it, and you become the resident driver. Of course, I love being the resident driver because it's a sign of my sobriety. Um, okay, we're going oh, to start... thanks. Well, just literally, just before we sum up, sorry to be a pain, I just want to mention I will not let go of the Jonathan Glazer Oscar winner story as he is being systematically bullied and harried by a thousand now signatories in Hollywood and from the within the film and TV and creative industries. Please go to our Instagrams. On, my, on our bio is the is the statement. They've got thou he's got thousands now. It's an open statement. Our names are there supporting him, and we would love it if you would all do that too. So this is really important. And what what's wonderful is a number of messages. A lot of messages are being posted publicly in support of him, and I just wanted to share a couple of them with you mm. because they're really important. Uh, Zoe Kazan, um, uh, actress. Uh, uh, kind of shocked that anyone who saw Zone of Interest could be shocked by what Glazer said. A movie so rigorously intent on not allowing its audience escape into sentiment or self-congratulation mm. that turns the mirror instead, asking us to look at ourselves and think oh. that the person who made that film might ask the same of us while accepting an award for his work. It makes me sad that this could even be considered a political stance. Part of the horror of the film is that it makes us face that face that the people on both sides of the wall are human. It might be easier on ourselves to think that they are not. I wonder if every person that signed this letter against him has seen the film. Exactly. Massive attack, the, the group. Jonathan Glazer is a filmmaker of the highest integrity, craft and bravery. A filmmaker who researches his subject matter painstakingly, weighs his artistic judgments with high care and deep humanity. That care, judgment and humanity led to the conclusions of his speeches, solidarity. David Ehrlich, I love this quote, shout out to the 900,000 Jewish creatives and executives and Hollywood professionals who haven't signed it. Yes. Because, you know, yes. those who shout the loudest don't represent yeah. the majority opinion yes. on this. And, you know, alongside that, Tony Kushner, the major playwright, Angels in America, he too said this, which I just thought was astonishing. Um, he said, da 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 what Glazer's saying is so, so simple. He's saying Jewishness, Jewish identity, Jewish history, the history of the Holocaust, the history of Jewish suffering must not be used as an excuse for a project of dehumanising or slaughtering other people. This is a misappropriation of what it means to be a Jew, what the Holocaust meant, and he rejects yeah. that. What, who doesn't agree with that? What kind of person thinks that what's going on now in Gaza is, is acceptable? acceptable? And then he says this to that thousand. Listen to this, that thousand. That's a really good if point. If you Think find yourself saying out loud and in public, oh, it's fine with me what they're doing because you feel that it's the only choice for you because you're a Jew, is to defend everything that Israel does. You know what? Shame on you. Shame on you. And I just think we need Beautiful. to hear more and more of these voices. Absolutely. I really, really love that point, Mark. Think of the 900,000 that didn't. Yeah. That's very, very powerful statement. Incredibly powerful. And, you know, the, the, the Jewish movement for this to be brought to an end brings me to tears every day when I look around at Instagram. Uh, there are so many that support that this whole... <clears throat> the whole thing that he was trying to get across. He stood up there. That's his first Oscar. He took his entire time on that stage to... Make this point shaking like a leaf because he knew and because it was scary to say it, and he should be applauded. applauded. Let's go to the let's go to the absolute, um, you know, font, the origin source of the horror of all of this. Let's go to the Auschwitz Memorial organization that allowed him to film part of his film and uh, about which this whole film was about. The Auschwitz Memorial, the Auschwitz Auschwitz Museum. No less. In his Oscar acceptance speech, Jonathan Glazer issued a universal moral warning against dehumanisation. His aim was not to descend to the level of political discourse. Ooh. Critics who expected a clear political stance or a film solely about genocide did not grasp Ooh. the depth of his message. The Zone of Interest is not a film about the Shoah. It is primarily a profound warning about humanity and its nature. From Auschwitz. 
Take your thousand signatures and shove them. Yeah. So Stupid people. Yeah. Stupid. Anyway, applaud, applaud, applaud. Love you lots, guys. Have, Have a great day. Have a lovely day. day. Don't forget, Curly Cooks tonight. Is it Curly Cooks tonight? It is uh -huh. tonight. Bye.